북한 인권을 개선하는 근본적인 힘은 바로 진실입니다. 북한 인권 문제에 대한 진실을 제대로 알고 제대로 알리는 일이 더욱 중요합니다. 제가 탈북인 구출 활동을 하면서 저에게 어마어마한 핍박이 시작이 되었습니다. 그리고 지금 북한에서 암살조가 내려와 있어요. We must unite and collectively speak out and be a voice for the voiceless in North Korea and North Korean de facto community. 북한 주민들은 지금 이 순간에도 당국의 혹독한 감시와 처벌 속에 기본적인 인권조차 유린당하고 있습니다. 북한 인권을 개선하는 근본적인 힘은 바로 진실입니다. 북한 인권의 개선 없이 민주평화통일의 길은 요원합니다. 우리가 지향하는 민주평화통일이라는 것은 남북한 모든 구성원이 자유를 누리며 함께 번영하는 통일입니다. 자유와 인권과 법치에 기반한 민주평화통일이야말로 우리 한반도만을 위한 것이 아니라 전 세계의 평화와 번영에 기여할 것이기 때문입니다. was the mass atrocity determinations against the Chinese Communist Party in Xinjiang province against the Uyghurs and other Turkic minorities. It got done on January 19th, 2021, just barely across the finish line. And the Chinese Communist Party reacted very strongly against it. Uh, they called the Secretary of State a doomsday clown. I don't know what that means. Maybe, um, maybe it lost something in translation from Chinese. And they sanctioned 20, 30 of us from being able to go into the PRC. We are visa, visa sanctioned. If I'm not included in that group, then they don't know the primary policy office from which this emanated and was pushed forward. We were also trying to push forward mass atrocity determinations in regards to Burma. But that didn't quite get across the finish line. And credit to the Biden administration for getting that across the finish line. They did so about a year after there was a coup in Burma. And as I saw the coup in Burma, I couldn't help wondering if the mass atrocity determination had happened before the coup, would it have prevented it? That is a historical counterfactual that none of us can answer because that's not what happened. But I was very pleased when that got across the finish line too. 
And then somebody who was not particularly into human rights issues, he was very into security issues and the Indo-Pacific strategy and such, he even acknowledged that the three places in Asia that call for a human rights mass atrocity determination are China, Burma, and North Korea. Even this official recognized that that was the case. And so why not, uh, why, why should there not be a mass atrocity determination for every type of mass atrocity crime, genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity put forward in, by the US government? Uh, this is something that I think would be a worthwhile endeavor. Second thing I wanna talk about is sanctions. There are many sanctions against North Korea. The main issue is not the number of sanctions. There are more sanctions that can be levied against North Korea, but the primary gap is in the enforcement of the sanctions. That's where there's a huge gap that happens. And that's true of the UN Security Council sanctions, that's true of US sanctions, that's true of a range of sanctions that are there. There's a uh, gap between the enforcement of those sanctions and the sanctions that already exist. Third thing that I want to say is that in Korea, one of the questions that I got was, is it possible to prosecute Kim Jong-un when he's a head of state? Doesn't he have immunity as a head of state? Listen to me now and listen to me clearly. There has never been immunity for mass atrocity crimes by head of state or anyone else. And that includes Kim Jong-un. And so, through international justice mechanisms, whether it's President Milosevic of the former Yugoslavia, or Prime Minister Jean Kambanda of Rwanda, or uh, the President of Kosovo, there's many examples that could be given where being a head of state provides no immunity from pro prosecution for mass atrocity crimes. Indeed, South Korea has prosecuted many past South Korean presidents. And yet, for far more serious crimes, these mass atrocity crimes, there has not yet been prosecution domestically against Kim Jong-un and the top leadership of North Korea. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to, like to close this part of our discussion before we turn to the questions from the audience, which we've assembled here, uh, and ask a question about information. And I know in our discussions leading up to this, uh, uh, Colonel Newsom, you had some thoughts about information and access to information. And, and I know Ambassador Lee, you have thought this through as well. And given what you've mentioned to, to me before about how the number of defectors because of, of strict controls has gone down, where are we also looking to find other sources? So if we can begin uh, first with you, uh, uh, Colonel Newsom. Uh, thoughts on information and how we here enrich our toolkit and have our best information available. You know, it's well, one thing I would point out, and I would sort of tell a story, is that um, this must have been 12 years ago at least that I was at a meeting with some U.S. government of officials, and one of them had just come back from, uh, I think, to, from South Korea, and he was saying, oh man, like North Korea is a black box. And he used that word. And, um, you know, so we're spent, you know, now we're spending about $80 billion a year on intelligence. And he was, it wasn't as much then, but he said, it's a black box. We don't know anything. And I was, am sort of resentful by nature. And um, so I sort of stood up in this meeting and said, well, how is it that you have these commercial companies in Hong Kong, and I named the, the industry, I won't hear, who are running wild in North Korea, who know everything that's going on in there. And the intelligence community in the US has no idea. Um, and the point here is that there's all sorts of ways to get information, uh, even in a place like North Korea. Uh, but it just takes some imagination and some effort and there's a lot that, let's say, the, the private sector can do uh, in this regard. It's not for everybody, um, but the information's there. And it, also, I would suggest that when it comes to a government, that if there's a priority put on a target, it's amazing what we can do. 
And I would suggest that human rights in North Korea has never been an intelligence priority of the U US. I could be wrong, but I don't think so. We've never acted like it. And that's something to keep in mind, is that when human rights in general, but in certain places in particular where you can do something uh, particularly useful, when, it, when it's something that our government wants to focus on, and our government, and I'd say some of the other civilized uh, nations as well, free nations, that when they put their effort into it, they would know just about everything that's going on there. Um, I would point to the, the Japanese have very good uh, access to North Korea via not at least their, um, the North Korean residents, uh, Japanese residents, what do you call it, North Koreans in Japan, um, South Korea as well. So there's lots of play ways you can get information if you want to, uh, governments and uh, private interests, uh, but it has to be, as I say, a priority, and you've got to want to do it. Uh, the first question uh, for Ambassador Turner, uh, you have spent a lot of time uh, on these issues. What, what has been the most effective uh, types of strategies? What have been the most effective types of strategies you've seen to, to assist defectors? I think this conversation about information is a really interesting one because while um, North Korea feels like a black box. Um, you know, as, as uh, both panelists have said, there are lots of testimonies from defectors. And while that number of defectors is going down um, because of COVID, because of other restrictions on movement, um, those testimonies continue to play an important role. There's also a 400-page Commission of Inquiry report that sits on my desk that I regularly flip through, um, which I think the, to the extent that we as an international community can help amplify the voices of those survivors, the people that have managed to take the difficult journey that we saw images of earlier and to get to freedom is really important. And so looking for opportunities to um, give them a voice, but also sending information back into North Korea is equally important. Every single North Korean refugee or escapee that I've met in my 20 plus years working on this issue has a story of a contact that they had with foreign information whether it be a K-drama or the Voice of America or KBS broadcasts, um, or I, I've been telling this story a lot lately, but I, I met a refugee recently who was an overseas worker, and she said it was her South Korean hair product that she used that kind of turned on the light bulb. If I go back, then I, I won't have a choice um, on what kind of hair product I use, or who I fall in love with, or what TV show I watch. And so um, I think that's another area in which continued investment uh, and uh, support for radio broadcasts, um, human rights organizations that are sending content in, uh, on micro SD cards is really important. And also just, I had a really touching conversation with a woman who uh, defected just a few weeks ago. And she was like, you know, I, I, I was about to do a, an interview with Radio Free Asia uh, for their North Korea broadcast. And I said, what, what do you think the North Korean people need to hear? And she said, really, they just need to hear that somebody knows what's happening there and that there are people that are fighting for them, that are advocating for them, that are their allies. Uh, and so I think also producing messages that we can send back in that provide that encouragement to people that have been suffering for a really long time is really important. Um, and those same channels that get information in are often great channels for getting information out. Uh, and so um, thinking about that network as broadly as possible.
Thank you, Ambassador Turner. And, and those types of approaches re require vision and require a dedication of resources. So, so you know, what we're hearing is we need more resources and we need to be supporting grassroots organizations. I, I know we have the executive director of HRNK, Human Rights North Korea, Greg Scarlett, to here. Support organizations like that and let's put our money, our time, and our energy behind that. Um, since you ha have, have mentioned what our, our average North Koreans are aware of, I, I'd like to go to uh, Ambassador Tan uh, with a question from the audience. Uh, is the average North Korean uh, aware, in your opinion, uh, Ambassador Tan, that there are others outside of their borders with greater liberties? Yeah, so I will build on what has been shared so far. Even though there's only an intranet, that the vast majority of North Koreans have access to, there is a an whole array of ways in which information is getting into North Korea. Radio broadcasts, uh, flash drives, laptops, cell phones, radios. There's many different ways in um, smart balloons. There have been many different methods used. And so I remember talking with a defector who said very casually to me, that the people in her village mostly have access to outside information. <clears throat> and even though the consequences could be rather severe, they still avail themselves to it because they're starved in the midst of the flood of propaganda that they get. They want actual true information that realizes that North Korea is not a paradise. Their existential experience tells them that but these outside sources give them a chance to be able to hear something different than the prevalent propaganda that pervades the society. Grant, one of our uh, guests here today asks, how can we change uh, the Chinese Communist Party's uh, repressive policy on repatriation? Do you have some thoughts on, on that issue? I would say that You've got to make it personal for the top people in the Chinese Communist Party uh, so that they have more interest in protecting their own interests rather than sending North Korean escapees back to North Korea. Uh, by that I mean is you take, the, say, the top 500 people in the Chinese Communist Party, you find their overseas assets, you find their relatives who have green cards and residence permits, and you publicize it to high heaven maybe make it a weekly show and broadcast it and get the information into China so everyone tunes in on Thursday afternoon to see who is the, the top guy who's got his daughter living in America, who has six, country, six companies, who has a bank account with this much in it, who has these houses in Hancock Park, Los Angeles. Um, you say you've got to make it personal and often the, it's hard for us to do and I don't know exactly why but um, if it isn't to live done in a way that, as I say, the people at the top of that system feel that they are going to lose an awful lot if they keep this going, um, it's probably not going to be effective. You know, another thing, you know, pull the People's Bank of China's license to operate in America for six months or longer, and you don't even have to say why. Say, you know, and they'll figure it out. But I say, if you don't apply that kind of pressure, there's no argument, there's no uh, sort of um, embarrassment that is going to work. It has to be done, as I say, so that the top guys are more worried about their own well-being. And in that system, there's often good reason to be worried about when that sort of corruption is revealed. Um, but that's the way that I would go about it. Mm -hmm. And Ambassador Turner, we, we've several questions that essentially ask the same, but from the opposite. How can outsiders, people on the mainland, people in Hawaii, uh, or uh, what one person writes is the average person who's not Korean, uh, do to contribute to this process or to change attitudes that promote freedom on North Korean human rights? I think one of the simplest ways that people can contribute, whether you're Korean American or not, is um, you know there are a growing number of, of North Korean refugees and escapees in the United States. A few here in Hawaii. Um, I was just in LA before coming here. There are dozens in LA, um, kind of scattered across the United States. 
they need assistance um, from English language classes to just connections with people. You know, can, if, if you can imagine coming from one of the most repressive societies in the world and then being dropped into the middle of Los Angeles, oftentimes when I meet a, a new refugee and at the airport and take them to their first visit to Target of all places, it's overwhelming for most of them. I've often walked in taken them into the toothbrush aisle and said, pick a toothbrush, <laughs> um, and they just freeze. Um, but, but looking for people who are willing to take the time to make connections, one, to help build trust, right? I mean, one of the great things about the US ROK Alliance is the people-to-people -people ties that I mentioned earlier, um, building those relationships. Because of the refugees that I met in LA, every single one of them still maintained contact with a loved one back in North Korea and was sending remittances back to their family members to help fund future reunifications through the networks um, or just to make sure that their loved one was still okay. And so you can have a really direct impact by just helping those people be successful here. That also helps the bigger strategy uh, in that another thing that I've heard from many refugees is, you know, I made the decision after thinking about my own life in the context of what I was watching on the K-drama that I had, had viewed or what I heard on the radio broadcast. And then I was curious what happens to the people that went before me. I, I heard about the restaurant workers that had uh, defected from China, and so I looked them up on the internet, or I asked around to get stories about what had happened to them. And so having North Korean refugees that are living in South Korea or in the United States who have great success stories of achieving the American dream uh, also helps build those, or plant the seed of the thought of what you know North Korea could be like if it was also a free and independent society. So um, I really just encourage you to think along those lines. I mean, there are tons of other ways to get involved and to be active, including engaging with your government, whether you be uh, from the US and, and calling me. <laughs> I'm always happy to talk to people. Um, or from South Korea and talking to either the Consul General or to Ambassador Lee. Um, you know, I think we want to hear and we need to hear from people uh, to hold us accountable as governments that do serve our population, uh, what you guys want to see us doing, what we can be doing more of, um, and so also that advocacy in approaching governments, approaching the UN is really important. Mm. Thank you, Ambassador. And, and building on that issue of success stories and providing a new life and new hope and new opportunity, uh, a question, uh, Ambassador Tan, uh, are we potentially, in building success stories, building potential for new leadership in North Korea, for North Koreans to return and contribute to a united Korea and to better help the people of the northern half of the peninsula? I think so. So um, we're talking about roughly 33,000 North Korean defectors in South Korea. We're talking about over 200,000 North Korean refugees in China. We're talking about hundreds, not thousands, but hundreds of North Korean refugees in the US. Uh, I would like to see the US make it easier for North Korean refugees to come to the US. I would also like to see the North Korean Human Rights Act actually be implemented like say, for example, the $10 million that was allocated for sending information into North Korea. Uh, in my time in the government, I saw that that wasn't being implemented. And I was surprised to hear that certain people in the State Department considered it merely a suggestion and not uh, something that they needed to follow, uh, even though it was a congressional mandate with congressional funding. Uh, and so I see that as a real mixed opportunity uh, that's been there but uh, it's a high crime to leave North Korea. And so to leave North Korea is a step undermining the regime. If you look at who's on the top of North Korea's assassination list, 
it is defectors who are speaking out. They publish a, a public assassination list and is made up of those who have left North Korea and are speaking out. They know too much and they feel, they seem like a big threat to the North Korean regime. And so there is an opportunity as people leave North Korea to gain greater evidence, to also hear their stories, to care about it, and to move forward with action.